In the last activity, we saw one of the most important properties of the Laplace transform, especially when we talk about it in the context of working with differential equations, which is the fact that the Laplace transform of a derivative of a function can be expressed as um, the Laplace transform of that original function x uh, multiplied by s and then possibly the inclusion of a initial condition x sub zero. So an in important aspect here is that this is little x, the derivative of little x. This is little x, so that's the time domain function evaluated at time is equal to zero. And this is the Laplace transform of x of t multiplied by um, the factor s. And so if you were to uh, extend that same derivation uh, for a second order derivative, so x double dot, so two derivatives, um, what would happen in that, in that derivation would be that we would apply the integration by parts twice, similar to what we did in the sinusoidal case. And so what would then come out of that is that you would get yet another factor of s that pre-multiplies the Laplace transform of x. Um, also, because we already had this minus x of zero term, that, that also inherits one factor of s, and a new initial condition is introduced, and that's the initial condition of the derivative. So if you remember back to solving projectile problems, um, you need to know the initial position and the initial velocity in order to solve that because it's a essentially a second order differential equation type problem. So whatever the highest order um, of your, your ODE, your derivatives of your ODE, you need that many initial conditions in order to properly specify the initial condition. So in this case, Second order, we need two separate initial conditions um, uh, for the original function x. So this is the little function x. This is also the time domain little function x, uh, its derivative, whereas this is the Laplace transform. So as you, as you keep getting higher and higher order derivatives, if you have m derivatives, this is kind of just generically showing you what it looks like, you have m factors of s pre-multiplying x. Uh, the Laplace transform. And then you get these decre decreasing powers with increasing derivatives on the initial conditions. And so this is a m minus one order derivative. So very elegantly, again, the important um, use of this particular property is the fact that we can convert a differential equation into an algebraic equation in the Laplace domain. So this seems like a very theoretical result that we're going to go through, but this is something that we'll use time and time again. And uh, what, this is, what this is essentially telling us is that if we have a function little y that's in time, uh, that's our time domain function, if we want to know what y does in steady state, so at once time goes off to infinity, so that's once everything's settled out and and uh, y achieves its kind of steady state, stable, stable value, what value is that? That can actually be inferred directly from the Laplace transform function, capital Y. And we do that by taking the limit as s goes to zero of this product, s times the Laplace transform of y. And the proof is not particularly revealing to understand what this is going to do for us. Um, it's going to do quite a lot, but I think it's still useful to see how the proof comes about so that you can understand where these results come from. So if we were to take a look at this, uh, actually this whole value here, we could express that as being um, essentially the limit of this value here, the limit of the Laplace transform of little y dot. So the Laplace transform of little y dot just from our past experience is s times the Laplace transform of y minus the initial condition on little y. Okay, so that is essentially the limit of this is essentially what's up here, uh, but then we're also adding this minus y, little y of zero. 
So if we rewrite what this Laplace transform is, we just insert y dot into this expression. And then now we're going to take the limit as s goes to zero. So we take the limit as s goes to zero, and that's going to essentially make the exponent of this exponential go to zero, which means that that exponential just approaches one because e to the zero is one. So once we are able to apply this limit, that removes this exponential, it turns it into unity. And so now we're left with just this integral, which is a function of time. It should be, uh, should be noted that um, you can exchange the order of taking a limit and integration when the integrand is, uh, behaves well and is continuous at that point as s goes to zero. And so that's an important piece. So we're making an assumption there, um, but this holds for most of our physical systems um, that we're gonna study. So now that this is just an integral uh, in time, and we know that the integral of a derivative is simply just the value of that function evaluated at its limits, we get this, this quantity. And so we can rewrite y at infinity as y of t as the limit of t goes to infinity. So that's the upper limit here. And then the last part, we subtract off y of zero, and that's, the, that's this this uh, second uh, endpoint. And so now, you know, the way that we set this up was we had this extra factor of minus y of zero. And now once we do some simplification, we get that minus y of zero term uh, as well. So what that means is, is we can just take this piece, these essentially cancel out, and we can take this piece and the limit uh, the limit of this piece, so that's what this is, we set these guys to uh, equal to each other and that gives us um, the result, this theorem that we, that we presented here. There is a similar, similar result, the initial value theorem, that provides information about the function, uh, time domain function, close to zero. Uh, based on the Laplace transform. So in this case, we're evaluating the limit as s goes to infinity of the product s times the Laplace transform. And that gives us information right after t is equal to zero of the original uh, time domain function. And this just after zero is kind of important because um, a number of times we'll be looking at forcing functions that use this delta function uh, which gives kind of this instantaneous boost, uh, and it's indistinguishable between a delta function and an initial condition sometimes. And so in this case, um, that information is encoded in essentially the value of that function just after t is equal to zero. When we take the Laplace transform of functions, and especially when we do the Laplace transform of uh, differential equations, we rely a lot on the linearity of the Laplace transform. And we've talked about linearity a couple of times, and so this is the first time we'll be a little bit more rigorous about what that means. And one of the ways to express that is the fact that if I make a transformation so in this case, the transformation is the Laplace transform. If I try to take the Laplace transform of a linear combination, so that means I'm gonna take one function and add it to another, and I could put some arbitrary scaling in front of each of these, that the result can be computed instead as these scalar coefficients brought out in front, and then is the sum of these scaled versions of these uh, transformed functions individually. So this means in order to find the Laplace transform of this whole function, I can instead find the Laplace transform of F1 and F2, go ahead and take these linear weights into account and then add them together. And so it means essentially that the transformation of the sum is the sum of their individual transformations and that you can also add these scaling weights onto them. And many of our important operators in math are in fact linear, and the linearity of the Laplace transform comes directly from the linearity of the integral. And so in this case, you should already know that if we have this quantity subbed into our, 
our definition of our Laplace transform, we can go ahead and multiply through this exponential to both of these terms, and that allows us to separate them into two separate integrals. And then these scalar factors can also be pulled out in front of the uh, the integral. And so it's it's um, it's really this linearity property that's going to make solving differential equations very easy because we can take a Laplace transform a very complex long ODE and we can do that term by term. And in a similar fashion, when we go to um, come back to the time domain using the inverse Laplace transform, we will also want to take the inverse Laplace tra transform term by term. And so this is the real enabling property that uh, makes that possible. The last property of both Laplace transform and the systems that we're going to be interested in, in analyzing um, is the idea that we're going to focus in this class on linear time invariant systems. And what that means is, is that um, linearity really means that we can add solutions together. And we're gonna, we're gonna remind you what that means in one of the up, upcoming activities. Um, time invariant really refers to the fact that the parameters that describe the system aren't changing. And so one of the ways to characterize those systems are constant coefficient ODEs. So what does that mean? That means that you've got something maybe that looks like a x double dot plus b x dot plus c x is equal to some forcing function. Um, and so what this means is a, b, c are all constants and um, they're all um, just multiplying single terms rather than the combination of x times x dot or x squared or x dot squared. Um, so the time invariance really refers to these constants and the linearity refers to the fact that these terms all enter linearly. All of the derivatives um, terms of the variable, in this case x, appear linearly. And so one of the consequences that's important in here is the fact that um, uh, inputs, when you apply an input, that has a nice property. If you apply two inputs, you can solve the response of those two inputs separately and add their responses together. Uh, and then another important um, consequence is the fact that if I shift by some, some amount A, so that's denoted here, if I, if I change my input from this to this, essentially shift, shift it forward or delay it by, by A, that all it does is it shifts the response. There's not any substantive change because I applied the input uh, A units of time later. So this allows us, these are nice properties of these systems, but again, these represent um, fairly um, consistent systems that, and they're the ones that we often see in, in the real world and in physical systems.